Thank you, worship team. Thank you so much. Went off. What happened? <laughs> Don't mess with my mic. Too much of echo. Can we cut that down, please? Thank you very much. Blessings on this new year, everyone. Everybody awake? <laughs> blessings, blessings on this uh, wonderful start of the year. We want to bless you in the name of the Lord. Amen. We bless you. Blessings, blessings, blessings to all of you. And I uh, pray the same prayer John prayed over the entire church. I wish that you would prosper and be in health even as your souls prosper. That's my prayer for you. Amen. Your prayer should be also the same thing for each other, that you prosper and be in health even as your souls begin to prosper. Now, there are many things as we begin to start this new journey as the new year approaches. It is not so much of making new resolutions and as it is in trusting and believing that God would direct our paths because, you know, Everything is so uncertain. Uh, we do not know what our tomorrows will hold. The past two years have been really, really uh, traumatic. They have showed us, shown us that we have, uh, you know, we have to learn how to trust and depend upon the Lord for our tomorrows. We do not know what a day can bring forth. As Jonathan preached on Christmas Day, we have to learn to expect the unexpected. Huh? That we, we, we do not know what to expect, but we do know that God holds our tomorrows in His hands. This year, I, uh, we've been praying, you know, with the leadership. Somebody once said, may 2022 not be 2020 part two. <laughs> and we trust that it will not be, that it will be a good year for every one of us. If everybody, amen. Now, see, in, in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, God says, I know the plans that I have for you. We all know that scripture. Plans to prosper you. That's the one we remember. Huh? To give you a good end. To give you a wonderful end. To prosper you and not to harm you. To prosper you and not to harm you. So, the thing that we have to learn to accept is that God has plans and He knows the plans, but we don't. And the plans, as He carries them out, involves sometimes our failure to understand them. We think that they are plans to harm us. That's why He say to us, listen, the plans that I have is not to harm you, although you will go through circumstances and different things that seem to be like I'm trying to harm you. But I'm not. That's where we begin to take uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. For we know, come on, that all things are working together for my good. Amen? Because I love God I have been called according to God's purpose. You are in church not by accident. You are in church because... All right, I'm going to kidnap this guy. So we are in church because of a divine appointment. I want those of you who are watching also to please try to make it your, your number one resolution to get back to church. It is so important to gather. There's a difference. He didn't say if you just stay at home. He says if you gather together in my name, I'm going to manifest myself to you in a special way. So it is important for us to gather as a community. Amen. But thank you for watching. Greet you and blessings on you uh, on this new year. And pray that the blessings will overflow upon you as well. But we need to understand that when all things, when Paul said all things, I mean the man went through hell. Literally. Shipwreck, beaten, stoned, in prison, you name it, he went through it. And yet he said, in all things, God is working behind it. And he's working something good out of it. 
We don't understand because we think that the plans that, I mean, what is this? If God is in control, how come? And we're going to talk about that uh, in, in a little bit. But the theme for the year, I'm believing that it's going to be a year of restoration. Now, almost instantly, we begin to think about what God's going to restore, and that's what I want to talk about. But there also has to be a restoration on our part in order to see a restoration on God's part. So let's go to the book of Joel chapter 2 and verse 25 through 27. All right? This is what it says. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. My great army which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. He's talking about the restoration, right? I will restore, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. Hmm. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. Not I'm going to be, but I am. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Amen. Now, let me just very briefly talk about the purpose. The reason why this happened was because God had been blessing His people. Every time God blesses His people, somehow they become fat and forget Him. That's why He said, when I bless you and you become fat, do not forget me. No, I, I, I don't think He meant fat like in fat. But I mean, when He talked about fat, He meant when you become prosperous. Because... Prosperity is one of the biggest tests to the believer. It is not poverty. It is prosperity. Because when we get prosperous, we kind of forget God. When a nation becomes prosperous, they forget God. So uh, what happened was every time they forgot God, God says, all right, since you have forgotten me, I'll just back off. And whenever God backed off, the enemy just invaded and things began to happen. All right, so now they were going through tremendous. This is coming towards the end of the, of the Old Testament already. They had gone from bad to worse, from bad to worse, and now they were facing real serious problems, and that's, where, uh, the, that's why God allowed this to happen. There was a purpose in it. Why did it happen? It says this, All we like sheep, Isaiah 60, uh, 53, verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Every one of us goes astray. Somewhere down the line. All we like sheep have this tendency to move away from God. 1 Kings chapter 8, 37 through 39. There is a famine in the land if there is pestilence or blight or mildew or locust or caterpillar if their enemy besieges them in the land of their gates. Whatever plague, whatever sicknesses there is, whatever prayer, whatever plea is made by any man by, uh, or by your people Israel, each knowing the affliction of his own heart. So it's basically something that they have done that caused the invasion to happen. And God always will deal with his people. Right? The reason why the land suffers, he will always deal with his people. Now, let me just go to the second one, which is the person behind the invasion. Notice, sometimes we, we look at all this and say, come on, come on, let's pray. Let's, let's bind every spirit, you know, this spirit of, uh, of, of uh, uh, this pandemic spirit, this COVID-19 spirit, this, this demonic spirit that's coming into the land. Uh, uh, we bind now Omicron, we bind the floods, we bind, we, we want to bind just about everything. But if you notice, God said, this is my army. Hello. All the locusts that came in, it is my army. Now, this is where I want you all to get the, the whole thing. The believer has got no dealings whatsoever with the devil. His dealings is always with God. See, I, I, I'm a child of God. I've got nothing to do with the devil. He's got nothing to do with me. My whole dealing is with God. Now listen very carefully now. Here is Job. You know the story of Job, right? You know, first of all, he lost. Who took away his stuff? The devil came. Took away his oxen, all his oxen, 
thousands of them, his donkeys, then came his sheep, then came his uh, uh, camels, then took away his children, his property, then took away his health. Now you notice God is very specific in the way uh, this whole process takes place, right? It's one after the other, after the other, and before you can recover, another one comes in. He doesn't come in like a flood, he comes in waves very often. And before we know it, we are thinking, now what's going to happen next? Now how many of you woke up this morning, it was raining, you thought, Allah, oh, flood. Now, the, now rain causes us to become fearful. The moment it rains, everybody thinking flood. I wonder whether church, first thing they think is, I'm sure the road to church is flooded. <laughs> All right. I don't know whether I can go to church or not. Sure flooded one. But the, and we think it is all of the devil. But what did Job say? Job said, we sang the song. He gives, he takes away who? God. God didn't take away, but he understood the principle behind it was God allowed it. And he was right. He didn't know what happened, but he just said, my dealing is with God. So the waves may come one after the other, but I'm saying I will deal with God. He didn't know the background, and here's the background. Satan came before God and said, you know, and presented himself, and God said, have you beheld my servant Job? Perfect. Of course, the devil said, sure, he's perfect, because you keep blessing him. You've got a hedge round about him. You're protecting him. Take off the hedge and see what happens. So in order for the enemy to do what he did, he had to first of all come before God and get permission. Luke chapter 22 verse 31, which I've been sharing last year. Peter, Peter, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail. So the devil has to ask God permission to do anything to any one of us. But God is in control. Can I hear an amen? God is in absolute control of my life. So whether it's good, see, we, we somehow have this idea, if God is in control of my life, everything's going to work out well. No. We're going to go through even worse things than the people in the world to prove that God is indeed God. And He's in absolute control of my life. And that I know how to give thanks in everything and rejoice always. Come on, church. I know it's tough. So I was preaching this morning, first of all, to the Tamil congregation. Many of them have lost tremendous stuff. But church, listen. Things can be replaced. Lives cannot. Right? Things can be replaced. But the thing that the enemy wants to do is to so shake us up that we will stop believing in church, stop coming to church. If God is in control, why must this happen? Why? But God is still in control. Very much in control. Now, why does God, why does God allow all of this? Now, He said, I will make, I'll make up for the years. We cannot buy back years, we say. If it's gone, it's gone. And we all know we're getting a little bit older now. Yesterday, we went up with... Uh, I think about four, one, two, three, four, four pastors to have lunch together. The wife was there. We began to talk about how we have to prepare for the next generation to take over because we are all getting on in years. And we cannot recapture those times, of course. But when God says, I will restore the years, time frame. In other words, what you, you have been trying to do over years can take place in a moment of time. In a day, things can begin to happen that can shift everything around. Now, we all know that in one day, the entire world, the system of the world collapsed one day. Now, very often, you know, I, I, when I pray, I begin to think of things that are happening in the world or things that happen to people. For example, I see people who are demon-possessed and how they manifest. When I see a person who is demon-possessed, I say, God, if a demon can so possess a person, I'm sure you can possess man. 
and fill him with all good things, whereas the enemy fills that person with all bad things with the purpose of destroying, you can fill us with life and life more abundantly. There must be something. Whenever we see the enemy working, we must always say, God, you do the exact opposite because you are God. Come on, amen. So, one of the main reasons why God wants to restore all of this to us. In Joel chapter 2, verse 26, 27, he says this. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Now one of a few things that I like to talk about just briefly as to what we should restore according to Joel chapter 2. The first thing is there needs to be restored in my life and in yours. Earnest prayer. I'm not talking about, thank you Lord for the food that I'm about to eat, bless it to my body, kind of prayer. I'm talking about earnest prayer. It says when the people pray. Now, I, I like this one. Listen to this one. You heard it, all right? Uh, all these things happen, and then it says, uh, let me see. In, in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 37, 38, listen to this one. Whatever prayer, whatever plea, all right, is made by, listen, any man or by all your people Israel. I keep saying this again and again, and I want to say it in the Tamil congregation, I'll say it to all of you again. Prayer and plea by any man, not just the children of Israel, which he said, or by your people Israel, but by any man. God loves the world. He is not the God of the Christian or the Jew only. He is the God of every man. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and those that inhabit it. Psalm 24. Those that inhabit it, they all belong to God. That's why we hear stories, you know, of people who have cried out saying, if there is a God, hear me, answer me, save me, in desperation, and God hears them. Why is it God saved me? I was baptized in sin, a druggie, on my knees, not a Christian. We often say, oh, God will only hear you if you are a believer. If you are a Christian, God will hear you. No, if any person prays and pleads, out cries out to God in earnestness, I will hear. And he came in such a powerful way to a sinful young, young person. Why? Because he loves the world. God so loved the world. Not just God so loved the Christian. Or God so loved the Jew. God loves this world. Come on. During the floods, there was a very good demonstration of people showing kindness and love to one another. Just reaching out to people, not with the intention of, I'm doing this so that you can become a Christian. Just doing it because you have love and compassion like God has compassion on people in this world. Yes, in the process, we want to tell them, you need to understand how much God loves you. He loved you so much, He gave you Jesus Christ. To die for your sins so that when eternity happens, you can be with Him. Come on. But our purpose in helping people is not just so that they can come to know Jesus, it's so that they can be helped. People need help. God came because he, we cried out to Him for help. Come on, amen. So prayer needs to be restored. Now here's something else that needs to be restored. You notice in the same context, he talks about whatever prayer, you know, each one knowing the affliction of his heart. Here we go. Uh, that you will hear and you will forgive. 
The second thing that must be restored to the church or to God's people is a heart of repentance. Very little is now preached on sin and repentance. Of course, we are not here to mark out your sin and tell this sin and that sin and all of that. But you know, it says, according to the affliction of your own heart. If you need forgiveness, we need to repent before God. Listen, I've gone to prayer conferences. They pray for the whole nation and bow down and kneel and cry and repent for the nation. Listen, I cannot repent for you. I cannot repent for a nation. I can only repent for myself. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach us to repent for a nation or for people that have committed sin. We repent for our own sin. Come on. Amen? If my people who are called by my name hmm, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal the land. It has nothing to do with the sins of the land. Of course, there are people out there. We know all the wickedness that's happening in our country. We don't repent for their sins. We repent for our sin. Come on, amen. <laughs> this morning I read a little saying by Spurgeon. He says, if you want to preach on repentance, pledge your head to heaven because people hate repentance and they will want to take your head. <laughs> But the church must come to a place, believers must come to a place where they need to repent of things that are going on in their own lives. A, a, a laziness of spirit or, or a lack of commitment towards God and towards these things. We need to commit ourselves totally to the Lord. Come on, you shall love the Lord, your God. Yo, I don't have to tell you that. You know that. You memorize it. You can just quote it straight away. I can quote it straight away. But do I really love him with all my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength? Of course, I like to preach messages that will just bless you and tell you God's going to give you a good thing. But listen, man. If there is no repentance, there's no restoration. If they will do these things, I will heal their land. Come on, amen. But the major thing, which I've been preaching for the past few months, last year. We need to have restored true faith in God. You know, everything that God does, all the miracles that he does, is for a reason, right? If you look at John's gospel, when you begin to look at John's gospel, John writes his gospel to prove that Jesus is God. So he doesn't start with the virgin birth. He starts like this. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by the Word, which is Jesus. And there was nothing made that was made. Jesus is the one who is God. In John's gospel, you have the, all the I am's. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the door. You have all the I am's in John. He's proving that Jesus is God. So why did Jesus turn water into wine? Now, how many of you have been to Israel? How many of you have been to Israel? Okay, those of you who have been to Israel, you're raising your hands. Okay, now we, the police know who you are. Okay. <laughs> but if you've been to Israel, like, like us, we've been so many times. The, the thing is, when, when you go, you also can buy wine from Cana of Galilee. This is the exact wine. Jesus turned water into wine. This is the wine. One bottle. 15 US dollars. All right. <laughs> I want you to know that the wine ran out after the jars were all emptied. And the wedding was over. It was finished. If they wanted wine, they had to go to the wine shop. The one that you and I go to. Same shop. And buy wine. It's all gone. It's finished. So why turn water into wine? John chapter 2 and uh, verse 11. This beginning of signs, this was the first sign, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. What was the purpose? That his disciples might believe in him. Why did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, knowing he will die again? 
Why? Answer, John chapter 12, verse 9 through verse 11. When the word got out that Jesus was not far from Jerusalem, a large crowd came to see him. And they also wanted to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. This prompted the chief priests to seal their plans to do away with both. Uh, uh, no, chief priests to seal their plans to do away with both Jesus and Lazarus. And his miracle testimony was irrefutable and was persuading many of the Jews living in Jerusalem to believe in Jesus. The purpose of the miracles is so that we might believe in Jesus. Why did Jesus feed the 5,000 fish? And he knew he, they would get hungry again. Why? So that they might believe, believe, trust. Faith in him was the main thing. So John ends his, uh, his uh, gospel by saying this, Jesus went on to do many more miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not even included in this book. But all that is recorded here is so that you will fully believe that Jesus is the anointed one, the Son of God, and through your faith in Him, you will experience eternal life by the power of His name. And again, let me emphasize, eternal life is not the ability to carry on living forever and ever and ever. Eternal life is the God kind of life that nothing can take away. No circumstance can rob you of this life on the inside. It's a life that only believers, those who have put their confidence in God, have on the inside of them. Come on, amen. Amen. So our faith in Him must be solid. But faith increases as we begin to hear Him. We were sitting and talking with the pastors and many of you know, they were saying... People misunderstand faith. We don't know how to, I mean, sometimes people take faith and twist it around here and they say, well, God has spoken, therefore it shall be done because the word of God says, you know, when God says something, it will happen. No, the word says this, but the word which proceeds out of my mouth will accomplish its purpose. It is the proceeding word and not the preceding word that counts. Jesus spoke and said to Peter, come. And Peter stepped out of the water and walked. If Peter decided every time they went fishing to step out of the water and walk, he would drown. But because Jesus spoke at that particular time, that's why it's important for you to come into a service like this and listen to an encouraging word, to hear the word of God so that your faith can be lifted up. Amen? Amen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But above it all, listen, the purpose of everything else, one of the major purposes is this, that, listen to this one, you shall eat in plenty, be satisfied, praise the name of the Lord, listen to this, you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. Now, earlier he said, praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. What is so wondrous about all the different kinds of locusts coming into our lives? What's so wondrous about it? He says, I have done something wonderful in your life. By sending these things wave after wave after wave, it's my act, it's my army. And you need to understand that in the midst of it all, I was in the midst of you. Just because our circumstances change does not mean that God has vacated his position. God has always been in the midst of his people. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Come on, amen. We are safe in his hands and no man shall pluck us out of it. That you shall know that I am the Lord your God, not the Lord your servant. Sometimes we make God like a servant. We think that God must answer. He must do this. We click our fingers and he must answer our prayer. If he does not, we get absolutely disappointed with him. I prayed and God did not answer. In the first place, who am I? That he should answer me. I am man created by him. What right do I have to claim anything? But because of his goodness, 
He blesses us. And He desires to give good gifts to His children. And He desires to surround us with good people and bless us with plenty that we may eat and be satisfied. Because He loves me. Not because of anything I have done. Come on, amen. So in the coming year, just, we have to just trust that God will restore. And He knows how to restore. The plans that he has are good plans, yes, but it is his plans, the plans that I have. Not the plans that I will give you or the plans that I will open to you, but the plans that I have. Secret plans. Unrevealed plans. But the plan is, you're going to get blessed. You're going to be satisfied at the end of the day. I will deal wondrously with you. I am always in your midst. As we come to communion table, always remember this one thing. God so loved me. That's what communion is. He loves me. No matter what I am going through, God, you love me. I can suffer losses. That's why Paul says, I know how to abound. You know why? When he said, I can do all things through Christ, but he talked about all the difficult situations. I know what it is to abound. I know what it is to be a base. I know what it is to have plenty. And I know what it is to have nothing. You know, all these things. God makes me more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Stand with me, shall we?